Okay, I guess it's five past, so uh, yeah, let's start. Um, I am unmuted, yeah, okay. So um, welcome together and thanks for joining us so early in the morning uh, for a little talk on OpenPMD. Um, I've given this talk already two years ago at Carlos and I thought maybe it's time for a revival. Um, I try to um, do this as a half slide, half practical beginner's introduction. Um, you don't need to follow things along live, but there are um, instructions on how to how to run the examples yourself. And um, there's also instructions on the slides, instructions in Metamos, so either screenshot the stuff or look into Metamos if you have access or ask me. Um, so yeah, open PMD. Um, let's look at the um, state of the art of how scientific simulation workflows um, um, typically look like. And typically they are complex. So this is uh, an example of a um, particle simulation now. But you can easily imagine, for example, I think Mala has the same um, layout, which is called in house here at Casas. So um, we have different stages of a simulation that need to span different time and length scales. Um, you don't have this one monolithic application anymore that does everything, but you plug your workflow together from several different um, applications. So you have different different codes that need to understand each other um, in order to turn into a kind of data processing pipeline that needs a common language to talk to each other. And the idea is to bridge these heterogeneous models by um, using standardized data. And our answer there is OpenPMD, <clears throat> which is the open standard for particle mesh data. Um, which is intended to be a, a markup for data that is hopefully understood by several different um, scientific applications. So PMD, that's short particle mesh data. And this being an introduction, let's first talk about what is particle mesh data even. So particle mesh data consists of mesh, of a mesh and particles. The mesh is um, the physical space, for example, that we are looking at, um, which is in general n-dimensional, typical is two or three-dimensional, but can also be more. Um, <clears throat> and this n-dimensional space is divided into discrete cells. And this way we get a mesh also grid of cells. One example is the temperature. So in this room, for example, we have a continuous um, gradient of temperature, but we can store every single bit of this. So we discretize the, the room and store for each cell, for example, its average or the temperature at the middle of the cell. <clears throat> um, temperature is a scalar number. Um, there are also vector, um, <clears throat> there's also vector information uh, like electrical fields. But it doesn't even need to be physical. You can also imagine an image, yeah, an image of pixels. It's the basically same idea. And within this mesh, you have particles, um, which are just listed. Um, so particles are um, defined by their position within the mesh. So you get the relation between both and optional further attributes like charge, weight, and so on. And this kind of data structure is often used in physics, for example, in the particle in cell um, algorithm, in order to have, on the one hand, computational efficiency by discretizing the space and not storing everything, but on the other hand, still having small scale details and small scale physical effects by storing the particles. So, kind of a compromise. Uh, now, how to model this into a data standard? Um, here we have the OpenPMD standard, um, a representation of it. OpenPMD is a hierarchical standard. Um, 
And the roots folder in this hierarchy, we call these folders groups, uh, is the series. So one open PMD data set is one open PMD series of iterations. Iterations in different contexts are called time steps snapshots. <clears throat> and each such iteration is a particle mesh data set. So you have the meshes, as we saw before, can be B fields, E fields, can be images. And we have the particle species, uh, like electrons, ions. Um, each particle species is defined by its position and further optional attributes, like momentum. And down below, you have optionally for um, vector uh, types uh, X, Y, Z. This layer can also be skipped. And down, down at the bottom in blue, we have the actual heavyweight and dimensional uh, array data sets. And each of these layers are <laughs> further described by attributes, which is lightweight data that we add in order to get scientific self-description. <laughs> The important part here is that this really is an abstract description of what this hierarchy looks like. OpenPMD is not a concrete serialization or it doesn't define the data set bit by bit on, by what it must look like on disk. But you can imagine this being implemented, for example, as JSON, as HDL5, and it is implemented as JSON, as HDL5, as ADIOS, and so on. Um, so for example, in Arios, a OpenPMD data set would look like this. Um, the top box are the n-dimensional arrays, so the heavy data in a way. You have, for example, an E-field defined by its X, Y, and C um, components of the vector. So we have a um, structured array <coughs> layout. And down below, we have the particles defined by their position and for numerical reasons, also by their position offsets. Down below, we have the attributes, some of which are um, defined by the standard, some of which are custom attributes added by the simulation. Defined by the standard, we have, for example, the axis labels, um, geometry, or the unit dimension, which is just SI. Um, defined by the simulation, or rather by a standard extension, is, for example, this field smoothing, which in this case is normal. Um, so the unit system, as I've said, it's SI. Um, you don't, uh, but often it's the case that units with or the numbers within the actual code are not really SI, but they are scaled. So additionally, you can set a scaling factor, which is the so-called unit SI, to give the relation to an absolute unit system. Looking a bit at the ecosystem, at the core of it all is the OpenPMD standard. Um, and what I'm mainly working on the OpenPMD API is reference implementation. There are several scientific simulations, uh, and this is just an excerpt. So um, on the bottom right, you see a link to our GitHub, um, where we list all the projects that we know of that use OpenPMD. Uh, so for example, there's Pick on GPU, WarpX, FBPIC, Simex Platform, WakeT, Hypace++, BMAT, and more. And I hope to soon welcome Mala uh, on this list too. And then there's further tooling, like native tooling also uh, of the different data back backends and data processing and visualization, like the OpenPMB Viewer, VisualPIC, PostPIC, YT Project, Visit, Paraview. Uh, so for some of these, like part of you are um, older existing um, applications that have an OpenPMD plugin that you can use. And in order to not let things get too dry, let's have a look at one of these, which is the OpenPMD viewer. Um, I have uh, created a Jupyter environment on Himera. So if you either want to follow things along now, um, to be fair, I'm not going to wait for you, but you can, you can do it if you want to. Or you can also follow thing, things later on your own. Uh, I have created a Jupyter environment at Big Data Share OpenPMD Seminar. I hope I set the permissions correctly. And a sample data set created by Pick on GPU at this uh, location. The sample data set has around 160 gigabytes, which is 8 gigabytes 
per iteration, so 20 iterations. Um, alternatively, you can also just start out manually uh, via, for example, PyPy packages. Uh, just install ping on GPU and uh, open PMD API and viewer. And if you install the open PMD viewer, there is a binary in your system which you can call and which then pre fills an open PMD notebook. Uh, from which you can start using the GUI of the OpenPMD viewer. So let's switch over to this thing. Um, here I have an instance. So this is what will be created if you uh, launch this OpenPMD notebook. This is now running on Himera. So this is the um, data set that I mentioned before. And the OpenPMD viewer is based on Matplotlib that has two ways of using it. Uh, one is the GUI that I'm showing right now, which you can use to just play a, play around with your data set a bit. The alternative is um, just using the API itself. So let's, for example, have a look at the charge density of some iteration at 800. Um, and as we see, we don't see a lot yet. And also, we see that this takes quite a while to um, plot the particle data here below. So we're still waiting for the particle histogram to come in. There we go, which is because that's the actual um, heavy part of the data, of the data set. So for now, we unselect always refresh on the particles to make this a bit quicker. And as we see, we see nothing because we need to actually search for the physics right now. Um, because this is a 2D visualization of a 3D data set. So uh, there is slicing involved. So let's walk through the slice. And here we are finding the physics. Let's uh, maybe pick another dimension. And here we see the start of a typical um, laser wake field simulation. Maybe let's proceed a bit forward in the simulation. So there we see the typical waving structure. Um, so let's adjust the histogram maybe to match this. So again, waiting a few seconds for this to come in. This is now a 2D histogram. Uh, no, a 1D, I mean. Because we can also alternatively uh, do a 2D histogram. Uh, way again waiting a bit time for a sip of tea mm -hmm. so this is not taking quite a long time maybe there's someone else on the node oh there we go um yeah and for now we have looked at a at the, at the charge density field, which is a scalar field. So let's also look at a vector field like the E field. So here um, we have the single coordinates of the vectors, the X coordinate, the Y coordinate, and the Z coordinate. And again, we can select slices and go through the space. And how about magnitude of the vector? Could you, could you also plot that one um, instead of a single coordinates? The, this is on far, it, it might be a feature of the API, but not of the okay. Game. So <laughs> I need to be fair, I, I didn't develop the OpenTMD viewer, I'm just showing it. Um, the mm. maintainers of this are Axel Lübel and Rimi Lee. Mm. So, yeah, this is just one example of the OpenPMD tooling. And yeah. So back to the text. So yeah, sorry, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, back to the text. As I've said before, um, OpenPMD is an extensible data standard. Uh, we've seen this before. You have things like in pick on GPU, the field solver, the field smoothing, uh, particle push, field solver, uh, shape. Uh, the idea is that OpenPMD only defines the minimum of what is necessary in order to have particle mesh data, but 
in certain fields you might want to have additional information like um, yeah, physical quantities that are not really fit for putting it into the base standard. So you have standard extensions. Currently, these standard extensions uh, can do custom attributes. Um, there is currently starting a project um, related to Helmholtz metadata call that is trying to um, allow more extensibility of OpenPMD, so custom hierarchies, custom data sets also. Um, I've, we're, we're just starting on this now. Uh, currently, it's custom attributes. And yeah, this is politically important and also scientifically important. OpenPMD tries to be a fair standard, so to adhere to the fair requirements, um, which is F-A-I-R. F is findable, data needs to be findable. For example, by having standardized metadata to identify where does the data come from, uh, data needs to be accessible. So OpenPMD is an open standard, um, can be implemented in various formats. Interoperable, this was the motivation slide at the beginning. So data exchange spans different applications, platforms, different teams, and data needs to be reusable. So if you imagine you find a data set out in the wilderness and it's just a NumPy array, then you don't know what it means. You need to go ask uh, the original data producer and ask, hey, what does this data set mean? But as we just saw, for example, in the OpenPMB viewer, yeah, um, we have uh, things like the access labels, uh, the actual unit that is being shown, the scaling of uh, of uh, numerical values. <clears throat> so the OpenPMD viewer, for example, used this in order to automatically fill in your plots. Yeah, you have here the access labels. Um, because it knows about this physical uh, information and doesn't need to guess or doesn't require that you input this thing manually in Matplotlib. Okay, uh, this was it on the standard. Let's head over to the implementation, which, as I previously said, is what I mainly work on. It is the OpenPMD API. And we try to adhere to some good practices for scientific software. So, also, the software needs to be accessible. So, um, OpenPMD is packaged in several common package managers like SPAC, ConvoForge, Homebrew, or Python Wheels. The implementation itself is in C++17, but um, we have a Python front end, and there's currently uh, a pull request on Julia. Um, the IO libraries in the backend, which we use for efficient data processing, are HDF5. Adios 1 is going to be removed for the next um, release in favor of Adios 2. JSON is not really scalable, but it's easy for learning. And I'm currently um, working on adding a TOML backend for configuration files. And Open P the OpenPMD API is um, available and tested on Linux, OS X, and Windows. And the idea is, um, on the one hand, to have this um, to have an implementation for this FAIR standard that is easy to use, that is usable in the scientist's language, but on the other hand, to stay efficient. So um, a backend can be chosen and configured at runtime without recompiling. And the software stack that you get this way is on the very left, you have your data producer or consumer which um, describes its data requirements in terms of, in terms of OpenPMD. OpenPMD itself then uses several backends such as HD5, JSON, Adios, uh, which I just mentioned. And additionally, on the, very, on the right hand, I have added diff different backends of Adios2, which are several streaming backends and several file backends. And in the easiest uh, case, you can pick one of these backends by just uh, specifying a file name extension. So let's go back uh, to a little live demonstration. 
Um, there are installation instructions for OpenPMD on our Read the Docs page. And I'm going to use a code example that is also public. Um, so you can have a look at that later on. And here we go. So here is again the OpenPMD hierarchy. And Since the open PMD standard begins with the series as a root group, it's logical that the implementation would also um, begin with the series object. So this is shown the Python API, as you might have <laughs> noticed right now, uh, by now. Um, here we set some default attributes and then create 10 iterations of electron data and temperature data. So here we define the electron positions. And since the position is something that is actually defined by the OpenPMD standard, OpenPMD knows that it's a length. So we don't need to manually specify the length, but we can just set it here. And we can, so we can set it if we want to, but we don't need to. Can specify comments or other custom attributes. And then we just create some random data and write it for X, Y, and Z. Down here, we specify the temperature. OpenPMD does not know about the temperature, so we actually need to specify the unit. Uh, for meshes, we also need the access labels, the grid spacing. And since the temperature is a scalar, so we don't need this X, Y, Z at the bottom, uh, we specify that we skip this layer by um, this little thing, which is a little... Uh, Ward, in my opinion, in the um, API. So I'm currently working on removing that. It's still necessary at the current uh, time. And maybe temperature is actually a constant, might happen. So we don't need to store an n dimensional data set, but uh, we can alternatively just say it's constant. And then the data set is going to be represented by, um, by a constant value. And let's execute this now. So you see down here um, the content of the folder. So this has now created the simdata.bp. BP is for binary pack, which is one of the backends of Arios 2. So we can use, for example, OpenPMDLS on that. And see, OK, we have written 10 iterations. We have written the temperature and the electrons. We can also use native Arios tooling. Uh, this way. So in here, we see the 10 iterations. We see the meshes, for example, the mesh of the ninth iteration, the access labels that we just defined. Down here is the, uh, are the electrons, the comment that we defined. <clears throat> but we can alternatively, for example, um, take another back backend like JSON. So same implementation, but different backend. And so, uh, what's wrong? Suddenly we have the same data set as JSON. We could also do a HDF5. I'm not going to show this right now. Uh, what I'm going to show is we is streaming. So SST is the um, streaming backend of Arios 2, which we mostly use. So if I say right now, then it doesn't return because it has created the simdata.sst down here and it's just waiting for a reader now. And the simdata.sst is just some networking address. So we actually need a reader now to um, start listening to this. So for example, this. And there we go. Now we can uh, 
as I've said, or, or what we've seen right now is uh, configuration via file name extensions. If you need to be more explicit, for example, for uh, compression purposes, uh, you can do this as a JSON format, a backend specific configuration. Uh, for example, let's write a config for Adios2. In Adios2, compression works by adding so called operators to a data set. So let's add. BSIP2. And what we see is that we see nothing because nothing changes from the big perspective. So maybe as a little proof that something's happening, let's add an operator that doesn't actually exist. And there we see Adios does not know this operation. And since uh, JSON is often somewhat hard to read uh, and you can't add comments, there is alternatively the option to add uh, Toml configurations, which has been recently added in the um, OpenPMD release as of two weeks ago, where this would look like this. this again okay and i'm going to show one further thing about streaming because uh, there has been one reader so far but there can also be multiple readers in order for this we need to add some little uh, configuration in order to tell adios to wait not for one reader but for two readers so adios2 dot um, engine parameters So we tell it to wait for two readers. Uh, we need to add the correct backend. So again, it's waiting. But if we now do open PMD minus LS, nothing happens because that's just one reader so far. So let's add another reader. And for this, we are going to use uh, OpenPMD minus pipe, which just redirects data from one uh, input to another output. So in this instance, we use OpenPMD minus pipe in order to capture the stream and write it to a file, for example, to an HDF5 file. And there we go. So this stream has now been read by two different uh, readers, and we can use HDF5 tooling for having a look at this data set that has now been created. And one little further thing, one little last further thing that I'm going to show as part of this uh, demonstration is that you can, for example, use this open PMD pipe thing in order to compress data sets that already exist. So you just pipe them from an existing data set to, um, to a compressed data set. So let me quickly go to Himera, where we have this uh, data set that I just visualized. So that's around eight gigabyte, let's make it a bit bigger, eight gigabyte per iteration. In terms of HPC, that's not a lot, but we can still um, save some memory or some disk space. I have um, prepared a little compression configuration. So here we have the compression.toml. <clears throat> so I used BLOSC for uh, compression, which is a bit more useful in HPC uh, contexts because it's faster. Uh, BSIP2 just takes an eternity. So let's say openpmd minus pipe in file. And we could either now address the entire data set by specifying this pattern here, but I'm not going to do this because 
uh, we want to finish at some point before lunch. So let's just do one single iteration and write it to a compressed file. Uh, let me just quickly verify that I don't already have this compressed file. I have it, so let's remove it. Okay. It would be normally overwritten, but I want to prove that it's live. Uh, out config, and this little add means that uh, the configuration is to be read from the file. So, this will take a few seconds for compression. Um, yeah, I hope the node is somewhat free right now. I don't have an exclusive node, so it might be taking a while for this reason. Let's see. Julia, who is running Julia on this thing? Okay. Um, let's come back to this later. It's compressing right now. Um, so what I just wanted to say, you can compress right away when you, ah, it's, it's finished, it's finished. You can compress right away, um, but I've already had users who said, okay, I have this data set, I forgot compressing, so how can I compress this after the fact? And this is how you can do this in OpenTMD. This is also how you can convert between different backends, how you can capture a stream to disk. So um, if we look how big this is now, it's around four gigabyte and still a legible OpenPMD data set. Okay. Um, I would continue in the text now. Uh, maybe if anyone has a question on the live demo, um, now is a good time. Otherwise, just interrupt me anytime. And <clears throat> so this final section of this seminar is going to be a bit less hands-on, uh, or it's going to be more on current trends on what we are experiencing in terms of I.O., um, what we can expect in terms of I.O. So if we look at the... HPC systems at Oak Ridge Frontier has just uh, started now. So Frontier is the current number one um, HPC system in the world. Uh, the previous system was Summit and the one before that was Titan. And if we look at their numbers, peak performance, file system throughput, file system capacity, they're all growing, but they're growing at different rates. So what we're experiencing is that the peak performance is growing a lot faster than the file system performance, meaning that increasingly the parallel bandwidth and the file system capacity are growing more and more insufficient for HPC at full scale. And also in experiments, uh, we are looking at a similar trend because camera resolutions are increasing, data rates are increasing. And Looking back to the motivation slide that I had in the beginning, this is a very I.O. heavy workflow uh, because you have one code that creates data and other code that reads data. So this traditional workflow that is often used at HPC, uh, run your simulation, dump things to disk, go home, drink a beer, come in the next day, load your data and analyze it. Um, it doesn't really work anymore in these systems because you just don't, don't have the space and the, the bandwidth to do this. Uh, so what we are exploring is scalable alternative is streaming. But before we get to streaming, one thing that is also often proposed for, um, for increasing IO performance is compression. And 
This is from a paper that Axel Hübel, uh, who is also very active still in OpenPMD and currently working at Berkeley, um, that Axel Hübel did on compression. And I'm not going to go into full detail here, but the big picture is that depending on which kind of compression you use and how you configure it, you go below the black line or above it. Below the black line means you're increasing performance. Above the black line means you're decreasing performance. The basic idea is if you have a very efficient compression, then <clears throat> the extra compute time that you need for doing this compression is equalized by the um, gained I.O. performance by need, needing to do less I.O. And this paper shows that it's indeed possible to reach this goal, to uh, use compression in order to make I.O. more performant. But you need to do things right. Otherwise, if you just do things blindly, you can actually decrease your performance and it also heavily depends on the actual system. So this is Titan and Tubnos, and they have completely different uh, results. And even if you get uh, below this magical ratio of one, then you're, you gain performance, but there are no wonders. You still need to access the um, parallel file system and you get some ratio of less data, but it's it's no wonders. So <clears throat> let's have a look at streaming. And this is a little setup that I used on, um, on Summit in order to benchmark streaming and benchmark the streaming throughput. The basic idea is if we, if we maybe go back to this slide to use streaming in order to stream directly from one code to another code and to bypass the file system. Um, so yeah, not touch the file system at all, which is not quite what I'm doing in this benchmark. I'm still writing to the file system. I just set up something that uh, uses streaming in order to benchmark both streaming and file IO. So uh, on Summit, we have six GPUs per node. So I run six pick on GPU instances per node. And I stream the data from these pick on GPU instances to OpenPMD pipe, which we just saw, which just pipes, captures the stream and then writes to disk. So we have two throughput numbers from this setup and we compare it against the third one, which is going to be the green line, which is just regular IO. And this file I.O. is going to be a bit more performant than the regular file I.O. because we already implicitly aggregate um, data per node and we have less writers as a result. So measuring the throughput in here, uh, I went from 64 nodes to 1024 nodes. And the Summit file system has a bandwidth cap of two and a half terabyte per second in parallel. And this setup was able to reach that threshold at 512 nodes. And I admit I on purpose did a setup that is very heavy in I.O. that writes really a lot of data. But still it shows that we were able to reach the bandwidth limit of the Summit file system at around 11% of the system size. So beyond 11%, this setup did not scale anymore because of I.O. Um, but if we look at the streaming throughput, it doesn't care for the parallel bandwidth because it is not affected by it. Um, so it's kind of a, yeah, not surprising, but it's still important to see that uh, with streaming, we get better throughput than we could theoretically even get by um, file I.O. And yeah, this uses the infinity band network of the file system on Summit. And even further, so this same plot, let's visualize it in a different way. So green is now regular file I.O. Blue is streaming I.O. And this uh, measures the um, time that each single I.O. operation 
needed and visualizes it as box plots. And we see that file IO starts out well, as long as it's still scaling. So we are between 10 and 5 seconds up to 10 and uh, 30 seconds. So things start getting slower already on 512 nodes, but on 1000 nodes, we have single instances that take up to a minute to finish. In streaming IO, however, we don't have this many outliers, and outliers are bad in parallel situations. And all measurements are within five and nine, nine seconds. Um, a further thing, um, I'm talking so far like streaming is a solution for everything. It's It has its own challenges. Um, two of these challenges are seen by this uh, plot. So with streaming, you re really have to start paying attention on the communication pattern that you are using. So are you distributing data only within your local node, within neighboring nodes, or are you streaming all over the place? Um, that really has a performance impact. And also the backend that you're using is really important. So um, I've used in this plot, um, I've done benchmarks with InfiniBand, so the actual high-speed net network of Summit, and with standard networking techniques, so TCP. And the bottom, the bottom graph that we see here, um, it didn't even scale up to 512 uh, nodes, so it just never finished. And at 256 nodes, it, each single operation took several minutes to finish. So <clears throat> for... HPC purposes where you really push lots of data at once and don't have this yeah, background of communication network um, like other patterns. You really need uh, scalable um, implementations for doing the streaming at all. And you need to pay attention to locality in order to be able to do things at scale. Yeah, this is what I just said. Okay. Okay, um, so looking a bit into the future on what uh, one might do with streaming is, for example, use uh, machine learning to create surrogate models. So one vision that exists is that of um, a surrogate model that models pick on GPU, where you have um, simulations that come and go. And the problem of this setup is that you just have too much data in order to do it via this yeah, You have many simulations, you need much data in order to create a um, surrogate model. So the idea is here really to use streaming in order to bypass the file system and not store um, data many times uh, the actually actual capacity of the file system. Um, but yeah, this is still looking into the future. The first step is even going to be just one simulation. Uh, but this is one idea where streaming is no longer going to be uh, optional in a way, but necessary in order to do it at all. This being said, um, this was a little exposed into uh, the current world of IO at large scale. If you're interested in using OpenPMD, um, go to our GitHub page, uh, go to our Read the Docs page, contact me, ask questions uh, now. And with this, I'm thanking you for listening. And yeah, if you have any questions, please go ahead. Uber is raising his hand. Yes, so thank you very much for this uh, quite nice introduction. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, first is uh, about the, the, the standard itself. You said that uh, the unit dimension system is just restricted to SI units. Are there any plans to change that in the future? Or is it possible to change it by myself? Because at some point, SI units are not like uh, yeah, a good idea if you do like really tiny numbers in a, an SI system, like in particle physics or so. Um, let's say there are no concrete plans yet, uh, but we can always talk. The 
basic philosophy of the standard is start out strict and relax things later. So if uh, there is a need for doing such, such things, um, you can propose a, st a standard. Yeah, but as I understood, you, you may define the data in any unit, and then you just provide uh, the reader then some some conversion to the SI unit. So uh, yeah, this is what yeah, I was but, but what, what I say yeah, what I what what I mean is when you, when you have some some like energies in I don't know EV or something like that, and yeah. you put them into SI units like joule, then they're really really tiny numbers and maybe also uh, yeah having problems with with float numbers and stuff. So yeah, th this is what I was going to say next. Um, so we are aware of um, of numerical issues, mm -hmm. and even pick on G for example pick on GPU output is not in SI. But it is SI, uh, but it is a custom unit, so to say. And additionally, you add a little uh, attribute, a little tag that says, okay, how do I scale this into SI? Okay. Okay. So you can, um, we can theoretically talk about doing the standard extension that you are proposing, but I don't mm. think we need it. But you can actually do it as a custom extension, additionally to SI, that you specify SI, how to convert your data into SI, but uh, additionally use your own system uh, that is equivalent to what is in the standard. Okay. Okay. And to, to make it clear, the the uh, uh, the actual data stored is in my units, and I just give the conversion. So it's just metadata. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. This, this, this is what I want to hear here. <laughs> uh, so I don't need to convert all the things I have in in SI. Uh, no, I and, and maybe, maybe the, it's okay if I ask the second question, uh, which is uh -huh. completely unrelated to this one. Um, you say that streaming uh, allows a way bigger uh, data throughput uh, on the huge systems when the file system limit is, is reached. And my question was: um, Is it possible? Is it is it conceivable to do these not just from maybe like you showed in a plot uh, like like one simulation and then streaming the data to open pmd and doing things there and then dumping it to file but hopping it through from simulation to simulation so that you have like first your uh, uh, like first principle simulation then uh, some other simulation where you put the throughput in and, and and so on and so on so that you have like a like a chain of, of stream where in, various positions uh, you jump in with yeah something like that yes so, so that that is the uh, that is the idea behind this um, it is definitely possible so mm -hmm. in order to, in, to emphasize okay. this again um, mm -hmm. I just did this for the purpose of the benchmark this is it's not something that is very useful to do in real it's just uh, for benchmarking purposes. Actually, um, I didn't show the setup of, of this one. It, this is a different uh, benchmark, but mm -hmm. in here I actually did this. So um, this was pick on GPU talking to a scattering code. Ah, okay, okay. And then the scattering code puts it out into file. So yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. And uh, from the from the uh, user perspective, is it hard to implement these kind of streamings uh, using <laughs> OpenPMD, or did you need to like? specifically from each uh, 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 for each simulation write a reader and reader and writer for the streaming specifically um, for that or is it just an open pmd thing and i can just plug it in ideally ideally um, you just use the same implementation for file writing as for streaming and just mm -hmm. switch backups mm -hmm. you the difficult parts are being a uh, uh, first, being aware that you need to um, somehow um, consider data locality. So the um, communication patterns are something that we would need to, you basically would need to approach me and then we would look, look into this together because this is something that you don't really need to consider in file writing or in file I.O. Um, then you need to use uh, a restricted subset of the OpenPMD API because OpenPMD by itself uh, allows random access to data, which is not conceivable in streaming because you have one iteration that you read and then the next, and if you read the next, then the other one is gone. So you need to 
write your workflow from the beginning <coughs> such that um, streaming is um, considered. Mm -hmm. And the last difficult thing is actually installing things on a system such that the um, scalable backends actually work, which is something where you yeah, need to look into the software stack of the system and see that you can get it to talk to audios, which um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's difficult, depending on the system. Okay, okay. But, I, I, I don't, don't, don't have this issue in mind, but okay, fine. Yeah, <laughs> but what maybe what the question was pointing to is, is if you have like some templates, because maybe in physics you don't have that like total variety of total different uh, approaches how to how to uh, yeah get the data and process the data but you have some typical uh, patterns maybe so maybe you could prepare like some templates uh, uh, within the like open pmd and and this could be then easily used by physicists to implement that streaming so the first uh, simple example of this is actually what i just showed uh so if you remember this code we were able to set, set a different file name extension and then it was suddenly streaming um but this is a very minimal example of course um concerning um the topic of chunk distribution um this is one of, one of the oldest pull requests that i have opened because I uh, opened it in 2019 and it's, it's still not merged. It's in a, I would say, usable state, but um, so there's still some work in progress there on really merging it into the um, main, main line. Um, I have prepared, uh, so on this branch, I have a certain set of chunk distribution algorithms that are implemented already that you can use. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so if, if that's what you mean by you know, pat patterns or templates, yeah, yeah. this... Yes, yes, this is actually actually, actually directly in my, in my uh, direction, uh, like um, that you have some kind of requirements on the simulation pattern, which uh, allows streaming, but without mm -hmm. reading, reading into the theory of streaming, you know, <laughs> this is what I don't want to do. Um, and this is also better for, for advertising if you go to, I don't know, CERN or so, and they want to do these kind of workflows where they have like five, six different uh, software uh, programs doing something with data and all the time they write to file and uh, load from file. And uh, just when you when you want to advertise this, then, then maybe it's a good idea to actually showcase that it's possible and uh, saying that the, I think, I think the real issue you, you, you mentioned was more not an implementation issue but an, an configuration issue that you need to configure the yeah. thing right uh, uh, and have some some requirements on your on your like thing like not randomly accessing data but you shouldn't do that anyway um, <laughs> yeah so this is this is what I think what what also uh, Jan means that that you have some kind of okay this is a pattern when you use this pattern you can use streaming as well as file, file dump. Yeah. No. So, so the basic idea is um, this call here is uh, what you could alternatively also use just direct access to the uh, iterations map, which then gives you uh, random access. And this call here is a restricted subset of the API, which ensures that uh, things are um, fit for streaming. And it's, for example, what we use in Picon GPU. So in Picon GPU, there is one implementation that we use for file writing, for checkpointing, but as well as for streaming. So there is no if streaming, then this as that, mm -hmm. but it's one implementation. OK, OK. Sounds, sounds promising. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, for asking. Uh, other questions? I would have one, Yeah, but if there are no other. Uh, so, I don't think so. Uh, well, it's a little bit philosophical, but <laughs> um, I mean, you you want to make that standard uh, as general as possible, right? Uh, but then, what's actually the difference between grid 
and between particle. Because in the context of particle and cell, it's pretty clear. You have mm -hmm. very regular grid, but in different uh, software, you might have uh, some irregular grid, some non-homogeneous grid, uh, even non-conforming grid. Uh, so actually, there's not that big difference in the end between like grid and and particles. So does it at the moment it does support some some uh, yeah non classical grids? Um, how um, far that uh, goes? This, so so um, let me first say that um, this is maybe a point again for standard extensions because we have predefined geometries. Um, if we look, for example, at this output again, the standard geometry um, is Cartesian. So what you are hinting at is other geometries that work in a different way. Oh, geometries, but you know, it can be very something very complex. So, you know, every cell might have different shape, could be a yeah. polygon. Polygon, uh, and these are somehow connected, and uh, you might have even non-conforming meshes. So that means that you have like a, 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 a loose ends. So somewhere, yeah, just, just some end edge uh, ends at the center of some face, maybe something like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in the end, if you consider all that possibilities uh, and you would like to make it really general then there is almost no difference between grid and particles so the uh, it, in the uh, end it's oh, it uh, turns out to be a matter of design on how do you structure your data mm. it's i mean if, if you look in the world of databases it's the same there's not one single way to model a world into a sequel uh, or, and the basic difference between grid and particles is that particles are an unsorted list of single items, while the grid is some structured, um, some structured structure. <laughs> uh, but what, what does it mean, like structured? Well, how, how is it structured? Uh, you have like multiple indices, uh, and do you expect that somehow? So, so the yeah, the, the basic example is of course what we have in a Cartesian geometry that you have a uh, structure where things are in a way sorted. Uh, that you have uh, at, at index zero zero zero, you have this property. At uh, index uh five and five you have another other property and yeah. they relate to each other by their index while uh the particles are a an unsorted list of uh other of properties that yeah mm -hmm. but okay yeah i, I see but the, the, this somehow limits the definition of the grid in fact yeah because uh yeah when you have something very like irregular uh, then you probably cannot have like multiple indices like this uh or you would need maybe some hierarchical indices because you have some refinement for this is, so, on. so the you initially said this is a philosophical question that you have. It's 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 a very practical question because we mm -hmm. have like this. We have codes like warp X that use uh, OpenPMD, but they do mesh refinement. So the question is, how do you do that? Yeah. And um, so, so is it the problem of the the standard already, or is it for that implementation and that can be extended or? Um, in the end, we are looking again at standard extensions because you, you can't define one standard that understands every kind of geometry. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you have to say, okay, I okay. have to define what this geometry works like and um, use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Like the, the most general definition of mesh could be just basically a list of particles, but actually instead of particles one would say rather nodes of, of, of the mesh and some fixed connectivity between them like connectivity metrics mm -hmm. uh, but 
it's an overkill for some classical uh, grids, like in particle in cell dead. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's a, and you still somewhat need to keep the standard usable because yeah. this is just one uh, implementation of it, but there are other codes like, like for example, the OpenPMD viewer, it now uses OpenPMD, but initially it just directly talked to HDF5. And so it implemented OpenPMD basically on its own by just using the standard. And if you make the standard more and more complex, then this gets a more and more difficult task. Uh, so there's also this to consider. So this, in some way, the need to keep things practical. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, further questions by anyone? Or was this answer somewhat satisfying? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. I mean, yeah, it's it's a it's a general problem. I would say That's a, not not like you could solve it just easily. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, then I would close it for today. Uh, thanks again for listening. And if you still have any questions, uh, come ahead and talk to me. Or as we've, I think this thing is also recorded. So yeah, thanks for listening and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye bye.